Hi folks, welcome to today's Coffee and Colossians. This one's going to be a wee bit different. Um, you'll see why in a moment, but let me just read to you the passage, because I think, for me, this is really at the heart of Christianity, and it's Colossians 2, 17. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Now, he's been talking that these, that what you eat and drink, r religious festivals, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Now, we've spoken about what these are already, but he's saying these shadows have been replaced. The shadows were reflection of a deeper light, and that light, a truer light, that light has come, and that is now Christ. So, for example, Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Now, in Hebrews, the whole letter of Hebrews is written because of the temptation of Christians to go back to... Uh, their previous way of life and previous religious forms. And Paul says, look, you're going back to the shadows. Now, shadow and reality, I think an awful lot of what goes on in life, and I think an awful lot of what goes on in churches and in our religion is shadow. And it's easy to take comfort in the shadows. And the reality of the presence of Christ is something that we don't experience very much or that we don't look for. So what I want to do is a little bit different. I'm going to play you this explanation of Plato's The Cave. Now, I regard Plato's The Cave as being absolutely crucial uh, or really important. Not crucial. Crucial is the wrong word. But uh, really important in helping us understand some of this. I think this is one of the greatest analogies ever used. And I think that as this is not a Christian thing, um, it was a TED talk, I believe, but I think that uh, you will, you'll see what I'm trying to get at. When we, so let me show you this. Bear with it, because I really do think it's worth knowing. So have a look at this. What is reality? Knowledge. The meaning of life. Big topics you might tackle figuratively, explaining existence as a journey down a road, or across an ocean, a climb, a war, a book a thread, a game, a window of opportunity, or an all-too-short-lived flicker of flame. 2,400 years ago, one of history's most famous thinkers said life is like being chained up in a cave forced to watch shadows flitting across a stone wall. Pretty cheery, right? That's actually what Plato suggested in his Allegory of the Cave, found in Book 7 of The Republic in which the Greek philosopher envisioned the ideal society by examining concepts like justice, truth, and beauty. In the allegory, a group of prisoners have been confined in a cavern since birth, with their backs to the entrance, unable to turn their heads, and with no knowledge of the outside world. Occasionally, however, people and other things pass by the cave opening, casting shadows and echoes onto the wall the captive's face. The prisoners name and classify these illusions, believing they're perceiving actual entities. Suddenly, one prisoner is freed and brought outside for the first time. The light hurts his eyes, and he finds the new environment disorienting. When told that the things around him are real, while the shadows were mere reflections, he cannot believe it. The shadows appeared much clearer to him, but gradually his eyes adjust until he can look at reflections in the water at objects directly, and finally, at the sun, whose light is the ultimate source of everything he has seen. The prisoner returns to the cave to share his discovery, but he is no longer used to the darkness and has a hard time seeing the shadows on the wall. The other prisoners think the journey has made him stupid and blind and violently resist any attempts to free them. Plato introduces this passage as an analogy of what it's like to be a philosopher trying to educate the public. Most people are not just comfortable in their ignorance, but hostile to anyone who points it out. In fact, the real-life Socrates 
was sentenced to death by the Athenian government for disrupting the social order, and his student Plato spends much of the Republic disparaging Athenian democracy, while promoting rule by philosopher kings. With the cave parable, Plato may be arguing that the masses are too stubborn and ignorant to govern themselves. But the allegory has captured imaginations for 2,400 years because it can be read in far more ways. Importantly, the allegory is connected to the theory of forms developed in Plato's other dialogues, which holds that, like the shadows on the wall, things in the physical world are flawed reflections of ideal forms, such as roundness or beauty. In this way, the cave leads to many fundamental questions, including the origin of knowledge, the problem of representation, and the nature of reality itself. For theologians, the ideal forms exist in the mind of a creator. For philosophers of language viewing the forms as linguistic concepts, the theory illustrates the problem of grouping concrete things under abstract terms. And others still wonder whether we can really know that the things outside the cave are any more real than the shadows. As we go about our lives, can we be confident in what we think we know? Perhaps one day a glimmer of light may punch a hole in your most basic assumptions. Will you break free to struggle towards the light even if it costs you your friends and family? Or stick with comfortable and familiar illusions? Truth or habit? Light or shadow? Hard choices, but if it's any consolation, you're not alone. There are lots of us down here. Okay, now, how does, let, let's forget all the interpretations. I think that um, Plato's The Cave really gets it in terms of the shadows and the reality. And it, it's like when you come into the reality, you're kind of blinded to start with. And then when you want to go back and tell others, they think you've gone crazy. And that people prefer to live in the shadows. And sometimes people return to the shadows so I think that's what Paul is, is talking about here. So, it, for example, in the area of worship, how we approach God, Hebrews 9 verses 1 and 10 talks about how these things were just a, a, a shadow of the things that were come, the various ceremonies and, and so on. In fact, let me read that for you. Hebrews 9 verse 1, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. But then verse 10 they are on, after listing various things, they are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulations applying until the time of the new order. Well, the shadows are gone. Now, there's another way that you can look at this as well, of course, because C.S. Lewis spoke of the shadowlands and that in this world, we're living in shadowlands compared with the glory of heaven. But what I would argue is this, once we come to know Christ, the glory of heaven begins to come down to us and we begin to live in the light and to walk in the light and in the reality. The irony is that so much of religion is dark and, and creates so much difficulty and so many problems. So, look, I'm going to leave it at that. I'm just going to say simply, the shadows are fickle and intransient. We need to get up to date. We need to stop going back to old forms. We have the substance of Christ and we need to long for Christ and seek Christ. I'm reading uh, Samuel Rutherford's just now, uh, letters, and you know, when he was put into exile in Aberdeen, he said, I thank the Lord for my tribulations because of the, the experience he had of Christ. A few times in my life, not many, but a few, I've, I've known a sense of the presence of God that made me long to go to heaven. That's the reality we look for. That's what we want in our church is that people come in and go, God is truly amongst you. We don't want people to see the shadows. We want them to see the reality. We want them to see the light. Now, if YouTube allow me, I'm going to leave you with Mumford and Sons' The Cave, which is a song about Plato's um, analogy. And uh, I'll give you the lyric version. And please look at the lyrics because they are incredible. It's empty in the valley of your heart. You know, let me at the truth that will refresh my broken mind. Um, I love it. If they allow it, if they don't allow it, then uh, go and just look it up on YouTube. Um, and we'll, we're going out with a normal thing, but otherwise, um, if I'm permitted to do it, 
uh, I will uh, leave you with that. But boy, what a brilliant, sorry for me, it, it, it's a brilliant thought that Christ is the reality and everything else is shadow. I think too often we treat our Christianity and, every, and like that as, as shadow and everything else we do is reality. Whereas, in fact, everything else is shadow compared with the reality and beauty and glory of Christ. God bless you and see you tomorrow. It's empty in the valley of your heart The sun, it rises slowly as you walk Away from all the fears and all the faults you've left behind The harvest left no food for you to eat You cannibal, you meat eater, you see But I've seen the same, I know the shame in your defeat you choke on the noose around your neck and I'll find strength in pain and I will change my ways I'll know my name as it's cold again time you take what is yours and i'll take mine now let me at the truth which will refresh my broken mind so tie me to a post and block my ears i can see where those orphans through my tears and know my call despite my faults and despite my Walking on your hands and see the world hanging upside down. You can understand dependence when you know the maker's land. So make your sirens call and sing all you want. I will not hear what you have to say, cause I.